Wow, that light is truly blinding. Um, hey, how's it going? Uh, my name is John. I work for a company called DNVGL. Um, I would pull the audience, but I can barely see anybody's hands. DNVGL is not the DMV. It does not stand for the Department of Motor Vehicles, which I often have to correct people. But it is a energy consulting organization. So, um, actually, just go back for one second. I got to say, I was on the BART this morning. Coming, coming here, and I, I was thinking about the title of this presentation, and I was kind of, I really wish we had renamed a little bit. It's a little bit presumptive. I think breaking down the analytical barrier, I think that barrier is still there. We're definitely chipping away at it with an ice pick. Um, so here's kind of what I wanted to talk about today. So who, who is DNVGL? DNVGL is probably a company that most people in here are not very um, uh, familiar with. Uh, so I want to give, I do want to give a little bit of a background about who we are, what we do, the different groups, how big we are, how, how, uh, how we became what we are, and also the energy industry as a whole. Uh, I'm going to talk about topics like emerging technologies, like electric vehicles, uh, solar, storage, things like that. And I'm also going to talk about um, the smart grid and where, where we're going and why we're using Spark and piloting Spark. I'll also talk a little bit about uh, our pilot. And, and how we saw advantages and disadvantages, actually, of using Spark, and where it a little bit fell short, and uh, where it helped us out. And uh, yeah, and I'm going to talk about a little bit of concepts that we have in development for using Spark. Um, yeah, so, so DNVGL, that's loud. DNVGL uh, stands for Det Nordska Veritas Germanischer Lloyd, which is the combination of two languages, almost three, um, Norwegian and German. And basically, it is a, a very large organization that has roots about 200 years ago, started as a classification industry, classification society. So uh, back in the day, what we used to do is uh, these ships were going out to sea and not coming back. So we would um, issue standards. And those we would actually write the standard, and then we would certify the ship to be upheld to a certain standard. It's about 200 years ago. And ever since then, that same kind of... Uh, uh, theme has gone through each iteration. I joined this company when it was something called Kima. Kima was one of the largest energy consulting companies uh, at the time, and it got bought up by DNV. Then DNV merged with its biggest competitor, GL. So now we have 16,000 people working at our, at our company. Um, we have about 150 years of history, offices all around the world in 100 countries. So we're pretty big, and we do a lot of stuff. Uh, Nick, just right before me, was talking about most companies uh, are formed out of acquisitions. Well, that's definitely the case with us as well. And he talked about all the different data warehouses when you acquire a new company. That's definitely the case with us as well. We have siloed data all over the place. And like any large organization, we're trying to figure out the best way to connect it all together. So I just want to talk a little bit about where I sit, because I can only really speak to our experience within this small group. I work for a group called the Policy Advisory and Research Group. And that is within the energy business unit of DNVGL. Uh, these are some of our service offerings that we have. Uh, we do demand side management, energy analytics, load research, service and market research, and program evaluation. I don't think anybody in here really knows what that is. Oh, maybe Andrew in the back. Andrew is my colleague who just raised his hand. But yeah, so basically what we do is we, uh, we take energy data and we analyze it. And we might say, something that happened. We might measure something that happened, and I'll show you an example of that. And we also do a lot of predictive analytics. So we try to say, OK, this happened in the past. How is it going to affect us in the future? So that's more of like the load research um, aspect of things. So that's a really cool picture. It's one of my favorite pictures. It's also probably the first thing you see when you Google electricity grid, and I think that's where I found it, to be completely honest. Uh, there is a guy named Philip Shuey uh, who wrote a book called The Grid in 2007, and it's, there's a quote from it that I really like. It's, uh, the electricity grid goes everywhere. It's the largest and most complicated uh, machine humans have ever made. And if you really think about it, it's kind of true, um, arguably, right? It is one of the most complicated things, and it's one of the most difficult things to maintain. When we talk about new technologies like solar, renewable, all these sorts of things, they're called intermittent technologies, because sometimes the wind is not blowing. Sometimes the sun is not shining. Unfortunately, uh, if you're an electrical engineer, you would know that in order to keep a grid up and running, you need to have it running at a certain frequency. So there's a certain number of hertz that it needs to be running at any point in time. 
If that hertz deviates a certain amount, the whole grid shuts down. So when you hear, I want to be 100% renewable, I'm right there with you, but there's some other things we need to do first before we are 100% renewable. So it's, it's a kind of a difficult question that we are uh, posed with, and we, we work together to try to figure out how best to solve this issue generally, but also our clients' issues as they see them as they come up. So this is an image, uh, it's a little cartoony, but it's an image of how the electricity grid operates now, right? So I don't, I don't know if uh, most people in here are familiar with this sort of thing. It's a little bit deregulated, right? It is deregulated in, in one aspect of it and it's not. There's a bulk system where you have generation and transmission. So these are the nuclear power plants. These are the, the bulk generation of electricity. And those go through uh, high voltage cables, the transmission line. These are very large cables that you'll probably only see in the woods or from far away. That makes up the bulk system. Then we have a distribution system. This is like your utility. So out here in the Bay Area, we have PG&E. PG&E is the distribution system. Someone like me buys my electricity from PG&E. So I'm the end user. I'm a residential end user. This building is an end user. But still, we buy our electricity from PG&E, more or less, and PG&E buys its electricity from the system operator. In California, there's something called Cal ISO, California Independent System Operator. So this is how it was um, now, this is how it is now, and how it was for quite some time. Wrong way. This is where we're moving to. This is a really cool image. Um, again, a little cartoony, but I'm a, a fan of cartoons. It's, it's, uh, it's a smart grid. So what if it wasn't so linear? What if it wasn't such a linear transgression from generated to passed on to this, to passed on to that, to passed on to this? What if it was actually a very integrated and smart city? We talked about smart cities in Tokyo a little bit. That's exactly what we're moving to. That's what we want to move to. That is the better way of ha handling our energy and electricity needs. However, it's complicated. I try to avoid the term Internet of Things when it comes to something like this, but it is, it's esque, Internet of Things esque where we have all these devices talking to each other, all these structures, and how to appropriately manage that kind of grid is difficult. It's much more difficult than anyone gives it credit for. Uh, one of the reasons I just said, maintaining the number of hertz, uh, the frequency of the, of the grid so that you don't have failures going on. Um, I have some examples that I wish I had thrown right in here, but I'm just going back for half a second. There's something called demand response, um, and there's, and there's uh, an electric vehicle tariff that I want to show you in a little bit. So demand response, just to give you a quick high level overview, demand response is basically, uh, some of you might be familiar with this, when it's really hot out, you can opt into this program and basically the utility has the ability to shut you down. So if it's really, really hot out in the summer, it's 100 degrees and the uh, grid's about to fry out, there's the chance that the utility can just curtail your load and it drops down. Um, some of the service offerings that we offer is we can, we can model that very closely and try to predict, hey, if tomorrow is going to be an event, what is the reduction in electricity going to be? That's only if you call an event. You need historical data for that. So uh, just like Nick before me, I want to get on a level playing field just a little bit. So these are some very common terms uh, familiar to me, but may, may not be familiar to, to this audience. So energy is a very generic term, uh, typically, but in this case, it just means the use of electricity over time, right? So demand over time. Uh, demand is instantaneous. At any moment in time, what is the power out of a system? A load forecast is the example that I want to focus on here when it comes to energy data science and analytics. Uh, I think forecasting and predictive analytics is something that we are all a little bit more closer uh, to understanding than some other service offerings and analytics we do. So a load forecast is, a load is another word for uh, energy or demand. So it's really both. If you have hourly KWH, then it's actually demand, because it's only one hour. All right, so this is a cool graphic. I love this graphic. Um, I did not make this using Spark. <laughs> but uh, I, did, I did define kind of my career after seeing this graphic. What this is, just to show you a little bit, on the, on the one x-axis going that way is time. So it's, this is hourly data. Um, you have temperature, uh, I guess, on the other x-axis or y-axis, depending on how you want to phrase it. And on either the y or the z-axis is the electricity load with a little shape fitted to it. So what do you see here? You see a very complex system of, of interactions and forces going on. 
there is obviously an effect of temperature. I think that's pretty obvious. When it's really hot out and it's really cold out, we use electricity to comfort ourselves, perceived human comfort. Um, depending on what day of the week it is, what if it's a holiday, what if it's a weekend, what if it's, a, what if it's hour two versus hour three. Um, and not only that, those effects change year to year to year. So what my job is, typically, is to decompose what's going on into something that makes sense. So here's an example. Uh, if you're familiar with R, I'm going to talk a lot about R, because that's how we've been piloting this so far. Uh, this is a plot of temperature versus electricity load. And each one of those little cells is a month. So on the bottom left is uh, January, and the top right is December. You can see a little marker going up there. So you can see in that middle, that middle row, that's the summer, more or less. That's the spring going into the summer and the summer going into the fall. That's where you see this really linear relationship uh, between temperature and electricity. Uh, in the winter, not so much, but you do see a linear relationship going the other way. When you put these two things together, they're actually very nonlinear. So this is what I was saying about uh, changing over time. What this is plotting is what we call load shapes. So they're electricity, average electricity demand over the course of a day. And each one of those lines is uh, the same day, year to year to year to year. So this is, uh, what, is that? what is that, seven or eight years worth of data. For each holiday, you can see that some years, the holiday load shape is much different than other years. But still, you can see a very pronounced effect of each holiday versus each other. Thanksgiving looks a lot different than Christmas, looks a lot different than August. And uh, January 16th is a random winter day that I threw in there just so we can have some comparison. All right, so when you put these two things together, let me back up for half a second. You see these, you can decompose each month. What happens when you have them all together at the same time? You get a very nonlinear relationship. This is just temperature versus electricity load. And you can see kind of here on the left, I've got a, a red line going through it. And I think everyone probably knows that's a simple linear regression going through it. It's an awful model. I would not be using that to use any sort of prediction. It does not capture anything about what's actually going on underneath. On the right hand, I've got a little bit better fit. That's a polynomial regression. So it's trying to capture the nonlinearities, but it's also imposing a model uh, form upon it, that it's a polylinear relationship. All right, so let's move on a little bit to some more uh, domain knowledge and expertise. I said that in, in the winter and the summer, there's heating and cooling elements. All right, so on the, on the left hand here, I've got the same graph, but now I've got a set point. So, 65 degrees Fahrenheit is the set point. And from there, I'm saying, OK, there's a heating load one way, and there's a cooling load another way. And that's how I'm accounting for the nonlinearity. I actually propose something else. I propose something that's a little bit more akin uh, to what some people would call machine learning. It's more statistical learning, where you, you do have some knowledge of what's going on. You do have some domain knowledge. But you're also allowing a, a lot of flexibility into what's going on. So uh, in this case, that is a smoothing spline. That is a penalized smoothing spline that doesn't impose any functional form, any restrictions on it, and it just kind of models the underlying data itself. You let the data speak for itself. And that's kind of the modeling that I like to do uh, in my day-to-day -day job. So last but not least, this is one of the more insightful and cool graphics. I don't know if anyone is a uh, time series buff, but this is uh, an autocorrelation plot. So each one of those dots is a correlation uh, with a lag. So you see the strongest relationship exists in electricity demand data with itself and 24-hour displacements. So the electricity usage that I use at 2 PM today is really, really correlated with what I used at 2 PM yesterday and is correlated with 2 PM the day before. And in fact, a week ago is even more correlated than what I did two days ago. So I'm talking about all this just to simply say these are sort of the relationships that we have to worry about. And we're starting to really worry about it when it comes to big data. So I'm going to speed up a little bit. These are some old school and new hotness uh, when it comes to forecasting approaches. We actually use a combination of a lot of these in what we do for forecasting. Um, and we, we do have to be very careful when it comes to machine learning, because there is a lot, of, a lot of things that humans do know about this. So you don't require a machine to tell you. And in fact, the machine might tell you incorrectly what's going on. So this is what I propose. And this is what I'm going to do in my little demo. 
So uh, I did a lot of research when I was doing my graduate degree in semi-parametric regression. And you can generalize the relationship that I just broke down in those, in those graphics in a very general way. You can say the time of year affects it, prevailing atmospheric conditions affect it, and behavior. That's, a very, that's other, right? If you're home, that matters if you're using electricity at your home. Um, if you had your cousin's birthday party at your house last week and you had 13 people in your home, that matters. These are, but you can't, afford, you can't assign a very uh, strict functional form to this uh, because you don't have the data to support it. What I'm about to talk about is actually, we might actually have the data to support that coming soon. And this is why we're piloting Spark. So I'm going to tie it all together to why I'm speaking at Spark Summit. Um, so we have all these emerging technologies that our organization sees across the industry. Electric vehicles, wind, energy efficiency, demand response, solar, and storage is actually the big one right now. Storage could conceivably solve the world's problems, but that, that was a nice little hype graphic, right? I think storage is somewhere on that hype graphic from Nick's presentation. So we have to worry about these things for our clients, and we have to show that we have a knowledge about this. We, we have data for a lot of that. A lot of that we don't have data for, but we know that in the future we're going to start having smart meters, smart sensors. Uh, our, our organization is already deploying a study in another country uh, where we're actually monitoring five-second intervals of end-use data. So we have meters on people's houses that are recording at five-second sampling frequencies what the end-use electricity load is. So how much electricity this light is producing, I can monitor that now in every single structure. We're talking about gargantuan amounts of data. Especially in this industry, we have not had that sort of information at our power in a long time. So here's just a quick example of what an electric vehicle does to the grid. So the blue line is a special electric vehicle rate. That This was, a, this was an experiment that uh, a North American utility did. And uh, the blue line basically kind of shows that um, in the middle of the night, if I incentivize you to charge your car then, as opposed to when you get home, you could save money. So in that way, we're incentivizing people to shift their load to the middle of the night. That's where they're actually drawing electricity. You can actually control when the power is drawn from the grid in this way, and we need to start considering these things. Demand response. This is a great image of what I tried to describe a few minutes ago. What happens if I just shut off your, your air conditioner when it's really hot out? The load just drops. All right, so that black line is what would have happened. The red line is what actually happened. A lot of utilities want to know Tomorrow, if I called an event, what would, the, what would the, that orange shape down there? What is that reduction? I need to know how much electricity I'm going to save. In order to do that, you need to monitor this and use historical data. So I just want to talk really quickly. We piloted Databricks. Databricks has been a great uh, ally to us. Um, they have shown me a lot. They've kind of introduced me to the world of Spark, and I have benefited from greatly. The reason why we did this pilot is because advanced metering infrastructure, I'm going to refer to that as AMI going forward, uh, promises a lot of things to us. I've got, a, I've got a list here, but more or less, it allows us to understand more of what's going on and model that. Once we have data, we can model that and understand what will happen in the future. So um, I think it's pretty straightforward. So these are the three things um, that we, we looked at. We wanted to understand the design of what this system would look like. We do not necessarily want to replace our entire analytics platform. We currently have an analytics platform that is concurrently used by about 30 to 50 data scientists and analysts and engineers at any one point in time. We are not going to just simply uh, get rid of that. But we do have mega projects. We're a consulting company, so every project changes. We have mega projects where Spark is a clear winner when it comes to this sort of thing. Data generating process, like I said, we have, we're looking at a future where the data generating process is much greater than it ever has been, and we need to be prepared for that. And the analytics. I think of analytics as a spectrum, right? So you have big data, simple things, sums and aggregations, and then you have big data, incredibly advanced analytics. We're, some, we're still way over here to the left. I want to be all the way to the right, but we're going to get there. And what our pilot was trying to understand is, OK, where are we? Where is Spark? Where are the other sorts of things? So I'm just going to fly through this. This is kind of the different data sets that we have. We deal with temperature data, you know, solar radiance, wind speed, all that sort of natural science data. But we also need to use financial, demographic, tracking data, grid infrastructure. We need to know the geography of the grid, where it is, what's malfunctioning, what's not malfunctioning, and of course, energy consumption. We need to know how much electricity people are using. 
These are the three things that we wanted to understand. What is the performance? From what we're doing right now, what do I get from using Spark? Scalability. We can't scale with our current uh, analytics platform, but if we do uh, cloud-based Spark, we obviously can scale very, very much easier. And granularity, we want to know at which level can I actually produce these models? At which level can I specifically get detailed information about my data and my models? And so the result, um, we've actually done three use cases. And I'm going to go through a, a notebook really quickly. I've only got about nine minutes. Uh, a notebook really quickly about what we did and some of the analytics that we did. It's more of a data science sort of thing that I want to show you what we did. Uh, the three use cases we did, so if I, if I shoot back real quick, these are the three things we considered. For performance, I took something that I do normally on my regular analytics server, and I did it on Databricks. And we just heard uh, from Nick Gartner that the best use case he'd ever heard was, I think, four hours old to 90 seconds new. Well, I can tell you we went from 23 hours old to seven seconds new, which, sorry, Nick, kind of blew that out of the water. But that's not necessarily a good thing either. Uh, <laughs> uh, so, so performance-wise, old to new. Scalability, we wanted to see how far we can go in terms of models. I think I saw a presentation where we had billions of model, uh, or rather features in a single model. And granularity, how many models can I make? And I'm going to show you where some of that broke down. So let me hop on over to my computer. Go over to the Databricks notebook. Hopefully everyone's kind of familiar with Databricks at this point in time. All right. Uh, absolutely. All right, so I'm going to show you two data sets. Can you see that now? Yeah. Is that good? OK, cool. Um, one is historical electricity demand across all of New England. Uh, it's about, uh, we'll find out in a second. I think it's 10 years of data, but that might be a lie. And the one's a true smart meter data set. This is actual data. I got permission from a client, which I cannot tell you who it is, but it is also a North American utility where I actually have their smart meter data. So one use case is to come up with a short-term load forecasting uh, problem using R and Spark and Databricks. And one is to come up with a very large model to use Spark R, which is the wrapper for MLlib. So I'm just going to shoot through this. Uh, and I was just going to have these cells in here just to kind of kind of show you that this data is actually not only publicly available, I actually have it on my, my little GitHub repository here. So if you ever want to play with this after the fact, you can download it just like I have to the driver. So we use R. And I just want to talk a little bit about R. Spark R, the API is not nearly as developed as we want it to be. right? And I think that's pretty obvious. It's just recently that we've been able to do that. I use Python and R majority. A lot of our data analysts use R. Right? That's what we, we are primarily statisticians. So we come from a statistical language background. R finally, the, the API between Spark and R finally makes a lot of this possible. So these are some of the packages that we typically use. I'm a big fan that I'm going to show you guys in a minute of MGCV. This is Simon Wood's Mixed General Additive Models Computation Vehicle. Uh, this is what I've used in a lot of my research to do semi-parametric modeling. So once I get, once I kind of get those packages in there, you can see that they've been updated onto my Spark cluster. Backing up a second, the Spark cluster that I'm using is only about a nine-node cluster. That's basically what we found to do uh, a lot of our work is very adequate. So again, that plot looks kind of familiar. This is that ISO New England uh, data set that I told you about. ISO New England is the system operator for New England. All of this is publicly available. So this is real data for all of New England, what their electricity demand was, and temperature there is at the bottom. You can see a very nonlinear relationship. Again, even in, even in this notebook, I can go and show those same graphs that I did. A linear regression does not work very well. However, there are many ways of dealing with nonlinearities in today's day and age. So I want to show you a little bit about making a statistical learning pipeline as we have for uh, a short-term load forecaster. So this is a little summary of the data set that I want to show you. I lied. It's not 10 years worth of data. It only goes from 2009 to 2012. Uh, but you can clearly see the variables in here. I have temperature, temperature forecasts, humidity, humidity forecasts. Load is the actual demand itself. It maxes out about 27,700 kWh. So typical predictive analytics, split it up into a training and test data set. I uh, kind of arbitrarily chose, for lack of time, 
from 2009 2011 would be my training data set and from 2011 onward or rather from 2012 onward is going to be my test data set so here's just a quick example of some cool stuff that's been developed it's it's very new that you're able to go in here and use r at all as a language so even in here, I'm able to do a lot of my work that I would do locally on a Spark cluster using Databricks um, to kind of go in there and make the features and, and variables that I need to do predictive analytics. I really kind of don't want to go over code. I just want to kind of show you what it looks like. So this is the one model statement that I do kind of want to show you. You're able to do a lot of really cool stuff these days. This is a, a function based off Simon Wood's package. So basically what I'm doing here, as you can see, there's additive terms for temperature, humidity, cloud cover, wind speed, month of the year, hour of the day, and 24-hour lags. This is controlling for the fact that the electricity that I used 24 hours ago is highly predictive electricity I'm going to use now. And the algorithm we use is restricted maximum likelihood. The reason I do that is because it controls for the fixed effects, uh, the degrees of freedom they're in the the month and hour fixed effects models. So this is a semi-parametric model that you can run in R. It runs in six seconds. This is some pretty standard output. I'm going to fly through a little bit of this because there's a lot of material to cover. And you end up with a model. You get uh, a, This is a wrapper right, for MLlib. So you get a model and a formula and all the coefficients you could want. I am not actually convinced terribly about uh, the ability to get the model out of there, although I did see a great presentation by MLEAP to serialize it outside of Spark, which was pretty cool. Uh, but that's going forward. This is one image I wanted to stop. This is sort of the things we like to look at. So if I can scroll down just a little bit. Temperature and humidity versus electricity load. We like to try to figure out what this surface really means and what we do. Let me zoom out just half a second. Let's center it. So this shape, this is a really important shape to us. We want to know, should we be modeling temperature versus humidity individually, or should we be doing some combination of the two? So like a temperature humidity index. A lot of load forecasting uses the temperature humidity index. R, Spark R, allows us to kind of look at this very, very quickly and fit a model, like I said, in six seconds that tells us what's going on. I'm then able to make a, a prediction about that. So using that model, I can come up with a forecast, a short-term forecast for the next 24 hours, and I can see how good it does. Uh, if anyone here is akin to forecasting, MAPE, mean absolute percent error, that's probably the number one most common error metric. And you can see that even that simple model that I estimated has an average, uh, average absolute percent error of 2.9%. So I just did this in like six seconds really quick. This isn't really a sophisticated model. This is something that I'm a little bit familiar with. And even that, you can get down to 2.9%. So I'm going to, this is some cool graphics of what the forecasts actually look like. You can see it actually doesn't do good on weekends. It's because I didn't control for it. But I want, before we run out of time, to show you kind of the smart meter data set. So this is actual smart meter data that I was allowed to use. It's from 80,000 households uh, in a non-disclosed location in North America. Uh, it's about two years of data for each one of those. It's an experimental design. So there's a treatment and a control group. It's an experiment. We're trying to see if a demand response program actually worked. And this is a lot of what we do. We need to fit giant models over a population size data in order to measure the impact of something like a demand response event. So I can just kind of go in here, and I've got this on Amazon. We currently, for the pilot, use Amazon Web Services. Uh, so I've stored a lot of stuff on S3. And I'm able to kind of go in there and repartition it and optimize uh, the way it looks. So there's 211 million records here. Right? So that's, even for us, that's not that big. That's about 20 gigabytes. Right? That's not that big. We, we are that use case that I told you about when we went from about um, 23 hours to, to 7 seconds was about 400 to 500 gigabytes. So this is nothing compared to that. but it is still a very good use case for us. So I am going to fly through here. This is kind of what uh, the usage data looks like. And I kind of wanted to just get to the end, because I'm about out of time. 
We want to visualize the differences between treatment and control groups. So just let me get to this graphic. This is a good graphic. This is basically the end all of what we want to know. We want to take all that data and I want to simply plot it. I want to say, what's the difference between treatment and control? Well, this graphic tells me, if you could possibly see the x-axis, that is average hourly KW. I can see that this blue line is shifted just a little bit to the left. So from a statistical perspective, I know that the treatment group is using just a little bit less than the control group. Well, can I take that a step further using Spark R? Well, I can. And I can see that each hour of the peak has a very similar relationship. You see that the blue line has shifted just ever so slightly to the left. And you can see that it changes from hour to hour to hour. These are actual things that are happening that we need to be able to detect going forward. And just for what it's worth, this is using the entire data set to kind of look at it. And finally, this is probably the last graphic I have time to show. This is what an event looks like. It's not a very good graphic. I didn't have a lot of time to kind of go in there and say, uh, you know, make the lines thicker. This is using Spark R, and we're able to kind of see, on an event day, do treatment groups use less? And just from visualizing it, right, this is pure data manipulation visualization, you can clearly see that treatment groups actually use a little bit less. So I tried to cover quite a lot in this, and I'm, I'm totally um, anxious to hear questions and comments. Um, I do have one more slide that I wanted to just quickly go over what we're doing in the future. So these are kind of the current concepts uh, that we're thinking about. So weather normalization at scale using Spark. So I want to estimate a model for everybody in California. Right now, I'm pretty close to being able to do that, uh, which is pretty bold of me to say, but it's, it's true. It's not a very complex model, but it's, it's getting kind of close. Real-time energy forecasting using statistical modeling and Spark streaming. I should be able to stream meter data into Spark and estimate forecasting models in real time or real-ish time. Real-time customer sentiment analysis. I want to know what people are saying about uh, PG&E. If PG&E is my client, for example, I'm not saying it is, but if it was my client, that is something I'd be interested in doing. Grid reliability analysis and cybercrime protection. Those are two things to me that are kind of close to each other. Using Spark, we can use a lot of the data that we haven't been able to use to identify failure points in the grid. And we can also detect uh, cybercrime when it happens. So anomaly detection, we're actually working on something that's able to do that in Ukraine. We're able to use Spark to kind of detect uh, hacks and uh, attempts to access certain parts of the electricity grid that cause it to shut down. So this is sort of the thing that we're looking forward to in the future. Um, so again, if anyone has any questions about what I just said, I'm um, all ears. And thanks for your time.